Since they were introduced into Generation 2, items have practically defined competitive Pokemon. Yeah, stats, abilities, and moves are all pretty important, but held items have the capacity to augment how a Pokemon plays so much that they fill a completely different role on a team. Like, Safety Goggle's Mousehold is annoying, don't get me wrong, but King's Rock Mousehold is terrifying. You see where I'm getting with this? Point is, items are important but not many people know that there are some items that were removed from the games entirely. These items range from generational gimmicks to signature items that absolutely break a particular Pokemon. So today, I want to discuss these various lost items in competitive Pokemon. If you enjoyed this video at any point in time, be sure to leave a like and subscribe because we're on our way to 500,000 subscribers. As a matter of fact, you should totally subscribe right now because I have a playlist full of competitive Pokemon discussion videos for you to binge watch right after this one. Also, this channel is partnered with Gamersups. If you want to support my work and get great tasting drinks, you can order Gamersups through my link in the description down below, or use code MOXIEBOOSTED at checkout. Gamersubs is a caffeinated product that I recommend only to my 18 plus viewers, but my link will send you to their caffeine free product section just in case. I'd really appreciate the support. Anyways, let's get into this. For this video, we'll be ignoring the vast majority of Gen 2 items, which just ended up being renamed in later gens. For example, the stick was renamed to the leek, and the mint berry eventually became just berry. Yeah, they're technically lost items, but we have them still, just under a different name. We're only really interested in items that change so much that they're a totally new thing or outright no longer obtainable within the game. Starting with... The Berserk Gene has to be the hardest name for a Pokemon item ever. Macho Brace? Nah. Assault Vest? No way. We're chomping on that Berserk Gene. This item only was found in Generation 2 Cerulean Cave, which is appropriate because it was the signature item of Mewtwo in that game, and only that game because it was removed right after this. In recent gens, Game Freak's been transforming certain moves and abilities into held items, like Overcoat being turned into the safety goggles. Berserk Gene, though, is like if someone at Game Freak found out that you can side target the move Swagger and said, oh, that'll make a cool item, and then they actually made it. This item would be consumed upon a Mewtwo switching in, doubling its attack stat and then confusing it. Now, this item might seem a little bit weird considering Mewtwo is largely a special attacker, but in Generation 2, it, it did have access to some pretty nice physical options. For example, back then all ghost moves were physical attacks, so Shadow Ball could hit decently hard with this. It could also run Submission to break special walls like Blissey or hit Dark types for super effective damage, which would otherwise be able to wall its psychic moves. Now, we need to ask, would the Berserk Gene be viable in modern day competitive Pokemon, specifically the official format of VGC. Honestly, I'm not certain. With the wide array of useful held items at Mewtwo's disposal in Generation 9, the Berserk Gene would be a tough item to make a case for. Yes, it does instantly double Mewtwo's attack stat, but an Intimidate lead could send Mewtwo immediately to just having plus one attack while still having it be confused, and it can still hit itself with that big damage after that boost. Incineroar would not only intimidate this thing, but possibly one-shot it back with a stab dark move like Throat Chop or Darkest Lariat. Don't get me wrong, there are some ways to make the Berserk Gene Mewtwo work. If Misty Terrain is active, any Pokemon touching the ground can't be confused, so a partner Tapu Fini would effectively make the Berserk Gene a no drawback item. Not only would Finny prevent the confusion, but the top three Intimidators in the game don't want to eat a Muddy Water or a Hydro Pump. And now that I think about it, the item being consumed would actually make it so Mewtwo takes reduced damage from knockoff. In my opinion, the Berserk Gene could be effectively reintroduced into the games today, and it wouldn't break Mewtwo. The game's simply been power creep too much for this item to make that big of a difference. Actually, I may even advocate for it. When's the last time Mewtwo's been relevant in VGC? Calyrex and Fluttermane sort of just invalidated. I don't know, I guess I'm kind of cool with Mewtwo going into PEDs if it means he can do well. Hello everyone, Brian Hans here to make a correction. A small detail Moxie boosted has missed is that the Berserk gene isn't exclusive to Mewtwo. It can be held by any Pokemon, meaning this item may have an actual impact. For example, imagine a Pokemon with the ability own Tempo like Mudsdale or Tinkerton. This also functions well when held by a Pokemon that pairs well with a Tapu Fini. For example, Zygarde or even an unburdened Pokemon like Sneasler. Imagine getting hit by A plus 2 Gigaton Hammer or A plus 2 Terra Flying Acrobatics. Pretty scary stuff. Anyways, that's all the time I have for now. I have to get back to living hits I shouldn't legally be able to live. And doing taxes. <laughs> Now, the Soul Dew isn't actually a lost item, but it's been changed so much from its original iteration that the original may as well have been a totally different thing. In Generations 3 and 4, the Soul Dew is possibly the most broken held item in existence. If Latios or Latias held it, they would gain a 50% boost to their special attack and special defense stats. For reference, that's like having a Choice Specs and an Assault Vest all in one with literally no drawback. I mean, the fact that this item existed in Generation 4, where they introduced both of those items with major drawbacks like not being able to switch moves or select non-damaging moves, 
is kind of crazy. They saw the soul do and said, oh yeah, no, that's perfectly fine. Granted, the item was so broken that it was banned from competitive play for a few generations, so it was locked exclusively to casual playthroughs, but my point kind of stands. The current version of this item is literally nothing like the original. As of generation 5, the soul do would simply give Latios and Latias a 20% boost to the power of their dragon and psychic moves, and nothing else. Yeah, it's a useful held item, but they typically run other options like choice specs or life orb. The original version of this item is truly just lost to history. The gems are another category of items that are simply lost to time. All of them are technically still in the game, but completely unobtainable with the exception of the normal gem. And this was always interesting to me because all it would take to make these items legal in VGC again is a simple distribution. Imagine one day Game Freak just decides to give out an event Glamora holding the rock gem. Now all of a sudden you need to worry about Tyranitars having a one-time 50% boost to their rock slides. It's a crazy thing to think about considering just how long these items have been gone three generations. The gems were a super common sight back in Generation 5 VGC due to their ability to grant certain Pokemon insane burst damage. Some notable examples would be Flying Gem Acrobatics Tornadus, which would have the Flying Gem consumed before the move went off, making Acrobatics double in base power before applying that 50% bonus in power from the gem, granting it a 247 power physical flying move after all the multipliers, including the same type attack bonus. Similarly, the likes of Latios would be able to run Dragon Gem to boost the damage of Draco Meteor to the Stratosphere at 292 power after the stab and gem. These items were key for picking up big KOs and matches versus bulkier Pokemon that would otherwise be able to eat the hit. The major downside to them was that you couldn't effectively use the move until it was worth it to pop the gem, since down the road you may need it to pick up something. Like I said, the normal gem still exists and we do occasionally see it on fake out unburdened Pokemon, but it's very rare and it doesn't really get any results at high level competitive play. I think that if Game Freak were to release the gems mindfully based on metagame trends, the gems could return and be balanced. Actually, let's start with the bug gem. You know those dudes need the buff. Okay, so we're getting into generational gimmicks, so it's a little bit more understandable why these items are no longer in the game, but Mega Evolution fans will argue until they're blue in the face that the mechanic should have been permanent. While I was a fan of Mega Evolutions when they were present, I will say that Game Freak was more likely to hand Megas out based on popularity rather than game balance. There wasn't really a reason to give Salamence and Tyranitar Megas when we have Chimeco over here forgetting that they're even a Pokemon in the first place. While most people know what a Megastone is, we should explain to some newer Pokemon fans. Megastones were held items that could not be knocked off, tricked, or removed in any way that would allow for a Pokemon to instantly transform and gain a new ability, 100 more base stat points, and possibly a new typing. Some notable Megas in the VGC metagame include Mega Metagross, Kangaskhan, Salamence, Mainectric, Charizard, Charizard again, Mewtwo, Mewtwo again, Rayquaza, and Gardevoir. And I guess we can count the primal reversions of Groudon and Kyogre, but those are sort of a different thing. Not really, but they didn't count as a Mega. You could actually have them and a Mega on the field at the same time. Game balance was a weird thing in Generation 6. Anyways, if you didn't at least have one Mega on your team, you were effectively throwing. Megas were sort of your king piece in any match, and your whole team revolved around them. While only one Pokemon was capable of Mega evolving per game, people would occasionally run multiple Megas on a team to allow for greater flexibilities in matchups. I mean, you can only bring four Pokemon to a game, so sometimes you would see a Mega Kangaskhan in game one and the Gengar would never show up. And then in game two, the Mega Gengar would show up and they would leave the Mega Kangaskhan at home. You see what I'm getting at? The likes of Mega Kangaskhan, Charizard, Metagross, Gengar, and Salamence dominated Gen 6 and 7 VGC, but other Megas had their moments in the spotlight too, like Mega Camerupt in early VGC 2018, or Manectric, which provided a lot of useful utility in Intimidate with Volt Switch and Lightning Rod before it would go for the Mega Evolution. While Mega Evolutions were introduced into Generation 6, their popularity earned them a whole nother generation of play in Gen 7, despite the introduction of... Dang, that was kind of a smooth transition. Z-moves were the generational mechanic of Gen 7, which functioned as sort of a powered up version of the type gems. Where type gems could be knocked off and would activate on the first use of moves of their same type, Z-moves were far more flexible. They couldn't be knocked off and you had to activate the Z-Crystal mindfully on the turn that you wanted to use them. Depending on the move's base power that you activate the Z-Crystal on, it would become a move between 100 and 200 base power with no secondary effects that couldn't miss. These moves would deal damage through Protect, but it had the damage heavily decreased. While offensive moves could be cranked up to become nukes with massive base power in a whole cutscene, status moves had their own special effect that varied widely. For example, Ghost DMZ Destiny Bond was a common option on Mimikyu, which would function like a regular Destiny Bond but with Follow Me built in. 
meaning that all attacks would be redirected into the user. And even Splash, a joke of a move, became somewhat useful on some Pokemon because it would increase your attack step by three stages if you combined it with Normally MZ. Beyond the generic Z moves, we also had some Pokemon with specific Z moves, like Kamoa's Clangorous Soul Blaze, which would grant it an Omni Boost after attacking both opponents with a powerful sound based dragon move. And we even had some really lame Z moves, like Lycanroc Splintered Storm Shards, which would clear terrain effects from the field, something that Defog and Ice Spinner can do just as like a side effect of their regular use now. It, it, I don't know, it's, it's pretty lame. Anyways, Z moves were a bit of a contentious mechanic, with some players insisting that they made the game a lot less fun when at any point a Heatran could instantly nuke a water or ground type with Bloom Doom off of Solar Beam. But as time went on, more and more players warmed up to the idea of Z moves. And in hindsight, they weren't that bad. I mean, now Heatran can just turn into a grass type and nuke a Gastrodon whenever it wants. So yeah, Z moves probably not that bad. While most items in Pokemon will remain in the game forever, I thought it would be cool to take a look at the few that will likely never return. I'm hopeful that a few of them may return though, like the gems or Berserk Gene, because they could see a re-implementation in the game if they underwent some changes. But let me know what items you want to see return, and if I missed any items in the comment section down below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like on it and subscribe to my channel. I post tons of competitive Pokemon content and have a playlist for you to check out right after this one. Thanks to all my YouTube channel members and Patreon supporters, and a special thank you to my most boosted supporters supporters Narwiz, Joseph B, and Kanor for their generous pledges. If you want to see your name at the end of my videos as well as gain access to bonus videos each week, be sure to support me by clicking the join button below the video or checking out my Patreon page in the description down below. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!